Well, welcome. In this particular video, we are going to be looking at um, centers of data and weighted averages. But actually, this is going to be a three-part video. This first part, we're going to focus just on summation notation and looking at the average of a set of numbers or finding the median of a set of numbers. Uh, the next video will be looking at uh, the weighted averages, and then a third video will be looking at frequency tables. But to start out with, let's first look at defining a couple of terms that we're going to be using in this uh, first section. We're going to need to understand what the uh, difference is between a mean and a median. Well, the mean, that you should, I mean, both of these you should already be familiar with, but a mean is something that you're really familiar with because you use it a lot with determining your grades because a mean is simply an average. And remember, an average is where we add up all the numbers and divide by the number of items that are in that set. Um, so that's what a mean is. The median, that is going to be the middle number, but you have to be very careful. In order to find the median, you first have to arrange the numbers in order from smallest to largest, and then find the middle number in that set. And if you ever have a situation where there's two middle numbers, and if they're not the same number, if they're both if the both middle numbers are 13, your median is 13. But if you have a number like that's in the middle, like 8, and another number that's 10, you have to find the average of those two numbers, and that will give you your median. Or in this case, the average of 8 and 10 would be 9. So that's how we find the mean and the median. And those are what we call measures of central tendency, meaning it gives us an idea of what the measure of center is going to be. Now, sometimes you might also see the mode being used. The mode is a number that's listed most frequently, so that's easy to remember. Well, let's look at how we use these uh, different terms in a story problem. Okay, so in this particular story problem, we're looking at the wacky widget company who has 15 employees. The jobs and annual salary for each job are given in the table on the right. A newspaper reported that the average wacky widget worker earns $78,000 a year. Well, we need to figure out which statistic, which statistic was the um, article reporting. Was it recording the uh, mean or was it reporting the median? Well, if I wanted to see if it was the mean, I could add all these numbers up and divide by 15 because there's 15 numbers in the set. Or I could find the median by listing all the numbers in order and then finding what the middle number is. It doesn't matter which method you use to figure out whether it's the mean or the median. But since we're already familiar with the mean, I'm going to go with the median for right now and see if um, that's the statistic that is being reported. So I'm going to list out these numbers in order from smallest to largest. So you can, you can go ahead and do the same. Okay, so anytime I list in order from smallest to largest, it's very easy sometimes to forget a number. So I'm going to count these up and make sure that I have them all. I should have 15. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So sure enough, I have all 15 numbers. So now I want to find the middle number. So I'm going to start crossing them out, uh, working my way from the outside to the inside. So I'm left with one middle number, which is 65. Now remember, these the salary is in thousands of dollars, so this would refer to $65,000, which is not the number that the paper reported. So that tells me that must have been the mean that the paper was reporting there. So why might most employees be upset by the newspaper article? And this points out the fact that uh, numbers can be manipulated um, because saying that the average or the mean of um, the average salary was $78,000 is not wrong. The mean was $78,000, but it may be an inaccurate measure of center because the workers might think that $65,000 is a better matter of center because it might reflect more as far as where the majority of the workers or what more the majority of workers make. Because if you look at the data, remember an average is supposed to be a measure of center. And if I look at the data, um, if $78,000 is the mean, well that means that there is, let's look at how many of them make $78,000 or more. Well we have someone that makes $380,000, 150000 90,000, there's another $90,000. 
But that's it. Out of the 15 workers, only four of those workers make over $78,000, and the rest make less than that. So it's really a poor measure of center. So that's why most employees would be upset, because only four of the 15 make more than uh, the $78,000. Now that brings us to uh, another way that we could identify finding the average of a set of numbers, and that's what's called summation notation. Summation notation, there's three parts to it. The first part is that we're going to use what's called subscripted variables, which we can identify as x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, all the way up to the nth number in the data. So in this case here, when I look at this, these set of numbers, I could refer to this first one as x sub 1, this would be x sub 2, this would be x sub 3, all the way down to the bottom would be x sub 15. So that would refer to the particular, the, the um, particular numbers in that set. So the third number in the set would be the 115, or $150,000. The 15th number in the set would be the 65 or $65,000. Now we use the Greek letter sigma to indicate that we're trying to find a sum, meaning we're adding up all those numbers in that set. The index i is used to indicate which of the subscripted variables are being added. So for example, if I wanted to indicate that I wanted to find the sum of all the widget workers' salaries, here's how I would write that. I would start out with my sigma notation, so my symbol sigma. And I want to identify the sum of all of the widget workers. So that would refer to my index. I would start with the first worker, and I would end with the 15th worker. So the i equals 1 means that our index is starting with the first. The number above the sigma is referring to the number in the set that we're going to end with. And this just tells us, identifies it. Um, what subscripted variables we're going to be using. So I could replace i with 1, i with 2, i with 3, all the way up to the 15th uh, value. So again, this is finding the sum from the first term to the 15th term. So if I saw this problem in my assignment and said find this value, what I would do is I would go over here and I would add up all of these numbers together. Now it's not asking us to find the average, it's just asking us to find the sum of all of those salaries. Now, if I wanted to find the sum of just the custodian workers, to identify that, I would again use my sigma notation. But if you notice my custodian workers, if we look here, my custodian workers are just referring to these three numbers. Now, in my data set, this would be x sub 8, x sub 9, x sub 10. So I want to identify that I want to find the sum of those three numbers in the set. So the way that I do that is I say my index, I'm starting with the eighth term in that sequence, and I'm going to end with the tenth term in that sequence using x sub i. So I could put 8 in here, that would refer to taking x sub 8, which is 27, Plus, the next term in the sequence would be when my index would be 9. So it would be x sub 9 is uh, going to be 24. And then my end with the last one, when x sub 10, which is also 24. So I would add 27 plus 24 plus 24, and that would give me the sum I'm looking for. So that's summation notation. We're going to look more at that with these examples. So here it says a full parking lot has 46 cars. Let P sub I be the number of people who rode in the i car parked in the lot. So we want to figure out, well, what does this represent? What does that symbol represent? I equals 1 in the bottom there, 46 on the top using P sub I. So the, what this represents is this is the total number of people who rode in the cars parked in the lot. So again, the reason why it's a total is because this sigma represents the sum. So we're finding the sum of all those numbers. So P sub i, again, represents the number of people who rode in the... So there might have been five people that rode in one car and two people that rode in another. We have no idea because we don't have that table in front of us.
And then we want to use sigma notation to express the mean number of people per car. So remember, the mean is the same as the average. So what we do in that case is we divide by how many there are. So we're going to take the sum, which we have written out for us already. So basically I'm going to rewrite that. So that represents the sum of all of those people that rode in the cars. I'm going to and then I'm going to divide by how many vehicles there were, and that would give me the average. So I'm going to divide by 46. So that's one way to write it. Or another way to write it is I could say dividing by 46 is the same as multiplying by 1 over 46. So both of these mean the same thing. They mean to find the average. So why don't you guys take and pause this video and try this next example on your own. And when you feel like you have both parts A and B written correctly, hit play to check to see if you got it correct. Okay, so let's see how you did. So in this particular example, it's looking at a beach resort as a total of 32 family suites. Let G sub I be the total number of guests who checked into each suite. So what does this represent? Well, this represents the total number of, of guests that checked into the resort. Just to rephrase it's uh, similar to that. This is the, or you could just say it's a total number of guests. And we're going to use summation notation to express the mean number of guests per room. So again, we're just going to start by rewriting this. And then to find the mean, we're going to divide by how many there are. So we're going to divide by how many rooms, how many numbers there are in the set. That's 32 numbers. We're going to divide by 32. Or you could have written it like this, 1 over 32 times the sum going from the first to the 32, 32nd term. So either one of those would have been correct. So there you have it. That is how you use summation notation to find the average. So that is where we're going to end this particular video. In the next video, we're going to be looking at how to find weighted averages. And in the third video, we're going to be looking at uh, frequency tables. So with that, we'll stop. So good luck as you work on the rest of this section.